So let me first say thank you all for attending. I am excited because I've always wanted to be on television, and, and our friends at Can TV are shooting this tonight. It's being beamed out live to uh, the audience of Can TV, and uh, that means that the heat, the pressure's really on me. Uh, if this is my audition opportunity, I'm gonna have to make the best of it, try not to swallow too many words, and try to make a little bit of sense. So on behalf of the Better Government Association and Catalyst Chicago, we welcome you to this idea forum. That's what the BGA calls these events. And one of our goals, one part of our mission, is to educate. And so every couple months, we have a public idea forum on an important issue. We come into them the exact same way we're coming into this one as a nonpartisan, apolitical watchdog organization that doesn't take a position on the issue at hand, good, bad, right, wrong, but believes that the more good, strong, civic dialogue we get on a topic, the better informed we'll be and the better we'll be able to make reasoned and intelligent decisions about these complicated and off, often controversial issues. I want to thank the Field Foundation of Illinois, which provided a grant to the Better Government Association to do a series of training programs called Citizen Watchdogs of Education. We go around the city and we hold forums, not like this exactly because they're more, they're more nuts and bolts training than they are informative. We try to train parents and regular people in how to keep an eye on their public schools what a local school council can and can't do, should and shouldn't do, the budget process, the principal selection process, and most importantly, how to keep an eye on what's going on out there. We also do training programs for regular citizens to watch government because we need people to be our eyes and ears. Without an engaged citizenry to let us know what's going on, we have a very limited watchdog function. Now, the Better Government Association, as you may or may not know, is a watchdog organization. We shine a light on government and we hold public officials accountable for a very simple reason. Better government is our right, collectively, folks. It's our right and it's their responsibility. Whether they're teachers or principals or administrators or mayors or county board presidents or the heads of departments. These are our tax dollars and they must be spent on us, the public, not excessively on public officials. And so what we demand of public officials is very simple. The acronym is FAITH. Fairness, accountability, integrity, transparency, and honesty. Now, if we were in England, I would be able to put an E at the end of FAITH like they do with all those words, and we'd have efficiency, so I could have that sixth principle but now, since it's the USA and we can't put an E at the end of faith, it's, I have to use it as a lame joke to tell you what I'm talking about. The point is, what we do at the BGA is four things. We investigate, we litigate, we educate, and we advocate for the better government that's our right. If you see that I'm doing a lot of rhyming, it's because over the years I spent a lot of time covering Reverend Jackson. And one of the characteristics that I admire most about him is his ability to communicate in ways that catch people's attention, and sometimes a rhyme is a good way. And so in the spirit of the education portion of the BGA mission, we have this idea forum, and Can TV is covering it live. And I, in one moment, I'm going to turn it over to a longtime friend and colleague. I'll just say one more thing. On the bench over there is literature about the Catalyst Organization, and about the Better Government Association. I've included about 50 of my business cards. I would encourage you to grab one if you like, and if there's something you want to pass along to me, call me or email me. And the last thing I'm going to say is this. We're only going to get better government collectively. Standing here alone tonight as the president and CEO of the BGA, I'm one voice. I am like Don Quixote. You may remember the errant knight that Cervantes wrote about several centuries ago. Quaint, charming, but ultimately ineffectual because he tilted at windmills. 
General Patton won the battles and the wars because he had the army. And so, the way we're going to get better education and better schools, be they charter or neighborhood, the way we're going to get better government in the city, the suburbs, the county, the state, the water reclamation district, and all the other units of government, the way we're going to get it is to demand it, and it must be done collectively. So, if at the end of this forum you think that these are important things to do, if you think the mission is important, what I've described to you, become a member of the BGA. Go to bettergov.org and join us. It'll set you back $25. That's less than a ticket to the Cubs, and we're winning a lot more these days. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, my old friend from the Chicago Sun-Times. We, we're at the Sun-Times together. In fact, I think Linda actually followed me as the education writer. Did I follow you? You followed me. Uh, Linda was the founder and publisher of Catalyst Chicago. She's the moderator of tonight's forum. And so um, all I would ask you to do is extend as much courtesy as possible to our panelists. This is not intended to be either a Fox News or MSNBC shouting match. The goal tonight is maybe a little more CNN. Talk about the issues and come out of it with an understanding. Don't come out of it ready to go, up, go out and you know, hit somebody over the head. Controversial emotional issues but really important to understand the facts and the points of view and to be respectful of them even when you disagree. So with that, thank you very much for coming out, and I give it over to Linda. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, BGA. I mean, we are really delighted to have this partnership. Um, we're kindred souls. Um, it's a great opportunity for Catalyst to, you know, to reach a new audience and to better serve the one that we already have. Um, I would like to add my thanks to Can TV, which has been really fabulous with us. Also, Chicago Amplified, which is a program of WBEZ, is here recording, and that will be uh, posted on the WBEZ website, and we'll let you know when that goes up. Um, we, both the organizations are tweeting at the uh, hashtag charter forum. If you don't know what that means, come up to me later, and I'll explain. Um, if you have a question, uh, there are cards that we would like you to write on legibly. Hold up your hand any point during the uh, presentation, and someone will pick up the card, deliver them to uh, Lorraine Forte, the editor of Catalyst, and then um, I will ask them. Um, I'm going to take just a few minutes to tell you a little bit about Catalyst, and some of you, you know, are, are not already uh, Catalyst followers. Um, we are an uh, independent, unaligned news organization that also acts as a watchdog and resource for school improvement in Chicago. And we've been doing this for almost 23 years under the umbrella of a nonprofit organization called the Community Renewal Society. Uh, we operate, it's like a little bit of a broken record here with Andy talking first, we operate out of the belief that you change these big school systems um, by having well-informed decisions in many quarters. Uh, be it parents, educators, policymakers, community leaders. No one sector can do it alone. Indeed, all of the sectors are needed. So we have a variety of um, news products and services that we hope will you know, hit the sweet spot for each of these audiences. We have a quarterly magazine, Catalyst in Depth. There are copies there. We have a parent newsletter that goes out to about 100,000 parents on report card pickup day. We have a website that has news and opinion, and we you know, welcome you to check us out, add your opinion, um, and pick up a copy of Catalyst magazine. And we, too, have a membership brochure in there. We'd love to have your support. Uh, end of commercial message. We're going to begin the program tonight uh, with some facts. Lorraine Forte, the editor-in-chief of Catalyst, has assembled them into 10 things you ought to know about charter schools, and she will share them with you now. Okay, we have a PowerPoint that um, we're going to get started. Thanks, Linda. Uh, so I can see. Um, at Catalyst, um, it's our job as journalists to, to sift through the mis misconceptions and shed light on facts about public education in Chicago, and that includes charters. Uh, there's a, a lot of misinformation that goes around about schools and about charters. I, I hear from the general public. I even hear it sometimes in the media. And so 
that's uh, why I put together these 10 facts that I, I think everybody who cares about public education should know about charters. Um, when I'm asked about charters, the question I get asked the most is, well, are they any good? You know, I'm on panels or up here on TV or radio and people almost inevitably ask that question and I say that charters are not inherently good or bad. And I know that there are you know, mis uh, disagreement about that on people on both sides who are really strong supporters or critics, but they're not inherently good or bad, neither are traditional public schools. You can find good schools in both groups. And that's why, to a, a large degree, looking at charter school versus traditional school isn't really the lens we should look through, um, although it has become the lens we are looking through. So in the panel, I'm sure we'll be tackling that question. So with that, we'll get started with our PowerPoint. And if you could click through. Okay. First thing. I still get asked the question or, or get told, charters aren't public schools. Well, they are public schools. Uh, the State Board of Education defines them as a public school governed by an independent board of contract, of directors rather, that uh, contracts with an authorized public chartering agency, which is a school district, to operate. So yes, they are public schools. They're operated under a contract. Their admission is through application, there's no testing to get into a charter, and they're given more autonomy over their curriculum and how they operate in exchange for more accountability, which means they're under contract, so in theory they can be shut down much quicker than a traditional public school. Number two. The number of charter schools is expanding. There, there was uh, expanding from one in 1997 to 51 in 2011. And you have 50,000 students attending charter schools in Illinois. Most of them are in Chicago. 37 charters in Chicago, 108 campuses, and the charter cap is now at, at 75. The state has uh, raised the cap for charters in Chicago twice. So there are about 38 more charters still to be given out in Chicago. Three. There are 12 in Chicago that have more than one campus. In other words, they have two, three, four campuses of charters. Uh, more than half of charter students in Chicago attend a school that's part of one of these networks. These are the big networks of charter schools in Chicago. And probably most of you have heard of them, Chicago International, Noble Street, UNO, United Neighborhood Organization, and Youth Connections, which runs alternative schools. So, three, uh, four. Uh, most charter students are low-income students of color. As you can see, they're uh, uh, African American and uh, African American enrollment is much greater than in traditional public schools. A little bit less for Latinos, more for low-income students, and less for children who are in special education. And I'm sure there'll probably be some discussion of of that during the panel also. Five. When we get to charter funding, that's where a lot of the controversy arises from because in a time of, of shrinking dollars, charters and traditional schools are competing for the, the same pot of money. Uh, per pupil funding that uh, Chicago provides to charter schools has gone up in the past three years. And it's not on here, but the amount that they are given is still much less than the operating cost per pupil that Chicago spends, which is about $13,000. And as a result, charters rely heavily on private money. This information is from an analysis that we did back in 2007. It hasn't been updated yet. Uh, and the numbers have probably changed, but the 
overall point, I'm sure, has, is not that a lot of charters, you know, because of their money situation, run deficits, rely heavily on private money and, and wealthy individuals to fill their budgets because they uh, don't get enough from the, the district. So, let's see, six. This is something that's unique to Chicago, although there are charters across the state. In Chicago, they, they're the only charters that have attendance boundaries. There's 10 charter campuses in Chicago that have attendance boundaries that um, assure some preference for neighborhood children in admission. Although charters operate on a theory of choice and that they should be open to any student who wants to attend, you know, there's been a lot of grass pressure in some neighborhoods for charters to some charters to have attendance boundaries so that kids in that neighborhood get some kind of preference. So in Chicago, there are some charter campuses that do have attendance boundaries. Uh, seven. Charter teachers are not allowed to join the, join the Chicago Teachers Union, but there is a growing union, uh, unionization movement in some charters. Uh, right now, there's 14 charter schools that have formed their own union, uh, which is called the Chicago Alliance of Charter Teachers and Staff. So we're, you're seeing here in Chicago a growing unionization movement for char uh, charter schools. Uh, number eight, teacher turnover. This is another big issue with charters. Uh, and with people who research charters and one of the things that they're looking at is teacher turnover. Um, a study back a couple of years ago found a turnover rate of 25% a year in charter schools compared to 14% in traditional public schools. In Chicago, you can see uh, the numbers, 57, 54, 51%. Uh, this is from an analysis that we did, um, I believe, a a couple of years ago, we have not updated it, but you know, charters will admit that there are some issues with teacher turnover in some charter schools, not all of them. I will, I, overall, it's, it is an issue, but it, it tends to vary based on the charter, of course. Number nine, student achievement. This is another area where there's a lot of I don't want to say politics, but there's a lot of discussion and parsing of numbers, which, you know, who's better, traditional, charter, magnet, et cetera. One area where charters do stand out is in graduation rates. Charters have much higher graduation rates than traditional neighborhood public schools, still not as good as your magnet schools and your selective schools. Uh, your ACT scores, which are, uh, you know, the, the bin, um, how you get into college, of course, much, uh, not much higher in charter schools than traditional schools, and of course, magnet and selective schools are still highest. On ISAT scores, for those of you who are really policy or really uh, follow this closely, the measure we usually see talked about is meets and exceeds. In this instance, I look solely at the percentage of students who are exceeding state standards because that's what researchers say kids need in order to be ready for high school and college. And as you can see, charters and traditional schools are pretty much neck and neck. Magnet and selective schools, much higher. And our last has to do with uh, our last slide, charters, public scrutiny and accountability. Earlier this year, Chicago Public Schools adopted policies that will put charters under more scrutiny, shortening the length of their contracts. Usually charters would have contracts for five years. Now they're gonna have, or can have contracts for you know one, two, three, or four years, not five, and putting performance targets into contracts. And I'm sure that there's more to that policy, but um, I'm sure that will be probably discussed in the panel also. So if you do have questions, 
and just a reminder reminder to write them down, hand your hand them to the person and we'll get to them later. So now I'll turn it back to Linda and she'll introduce our panel. Thanks. Gentlemen, do you want to join us? Okay, let the discussion begin. Um, the bios of the, the panelists are in your program, so I will be very brief in introducing them. Andrew Broy is the president of the Illinois Network of Charter Schools. His father taught in the Chicago Public Schools for 30 years, and Andrew began his adult life as a high school English teacher. Um, but then he became a lawyer, but we'll forgive him for that. Um, he was a state education official in Georgia before coming to Chicago uh, to join INCS. Jackson Potter is the staff coordinator for the Chicago Teachers Union. He has taught at two Chicago high schools, Little Village Lawndale and Englewood, which was closed as part of Renaissance 2010 while he was on staff there, so he got a first-hand taste of what that's all about. Um, he also worked at Manley High School with the Emoja Student Development Corporation to help students uh, get prepared to um, enter college, among other things. Charles Payne is a professor at the University of Chicago in the School of Social Service Administration. He is the author of So Much, Re so Much Reform, So Little Change, a book I recommend to you. Uh, once upon a time, uh, he founded an organization in Newark to encourage kids to pursue math and science careers. So you can see our panelists have a mix of grassroots and, and policy level um, experience. Um, uh, here's brief, briefly how the pr program is going to go. Uh, each panelist will make an opening statement of two to three minutes, maximum. Uh, then I get to ask some questions because I have the microphone. And then we will take questions from the audience uh, for about 30 minutes at the end. Again, throughout the discussion, raise your hand so we can get your questions and you can get them in early. So let me start with... Uh, Two of the main reasons for starting charter schools are that um, competition would in, in improve neighborhood schools and that there would be innovations that could be spread to other schools. So as I understood it, charter schools were about more than just adding the kids, educating the kids who were in them. They were supposed to improve the system. system. And I'd like to ask the panelists whether they've seen you know, evidence that either of these things is being achieved, you know, competition, improving other schools, and innovations spreading. Andrew, I'm going to pick, oh, you know what? You're supposed to start with the opening sentence. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, I went right into my question. Let me put that on hold, go back to the panelists and have them do their opening statements. Now we'll start with Andrew, sorry. All right, well, I'll th thank you, Linda, and thank you to the BGA and for Catalyst for hosting this. Um, anytime we can talk about school policy in Chicago is a good night especially in a forum like this, we're going to have a reasoned debate. Um, you know, I'll start out just by putting some figures in context. Uh, I think we have a citywide performance problem we'd all acknowledge up on the panel. Um, if one examines NAEP results over the past two administrations, and that's the nation's report card, the national comparative data set, um, the range of performance across all schools in Chicago, charter, traditional, public, magnet, and so forth, uh, depending on content area and grade span has been between a low of about 9% proficient to a high of about 21% proficient. So what that means is between 1 in 5 students and 1 in 10 students in Chicago is meeting benchmarks that are grade appropriate. Um, that's a problem for the city, it's a problem for economic viability, for social mobility, and for our future. Um, and so I think to some degree charters were designed back in the mid-90s to address that. Um, the slides you saw earlier um, are illustrative in one respect. Uh, the charter concept is rather simple. It's that a performance contract is granted to a group of educators to run a school, and in exchange for flexibility to the school on things like longer school day, curriculum choices, testing batteries, um, the school has to produce results. If the school doesn't produce results, it can be closed. The charter can be ended. Um, if it does produce results, it can um, um, continue on. Um, one of the reasons I migrated from the regular public school system that I, where I taught, um, I've managed schools over the years, I've been a state department official working on education, is that the charter sector is the one place I can go from idea to implementation in a very short time frame. 
And I think that the challenges facing us are of the scale that we've got to be able to have results now. We can't wait another two years for another reform. Um, I also tend to think that charter schools are the one whole school reform that throws out all assumptions and allows you to build a school from the ground up. So the traditional way of doing reform in many districts has always been find a problem, design a program. So we have lagging math scores, design a math program. You've got truancy challenges, have an after school program. Uh, charter schools throw that assumption out and say, why don't we build the school around the needs of the local parents and students and design it in that way. Um, and I think the model itself, while not always successful, um, is a very good thing to move the system forward. And I'll give you two examples of that. Um, so in the recently concluded uh, CTU negotiations, a uh, few of the issues on the table, longer school day implementation, uh, teacher evaluations based on student growth, um, those are debates going on but have been existing in the charter sector for the better part of the past decade. So in that respect, charters are leading in terms of innovation and showing the way to what the districts can wind up doing. Um, I'll close my remarks with, with more of a philosophical point about what charters are designed to do. Um, in our view at INCS, uh, we see the charter movement doing two things pretty well. Uh, the first is creating more high quality schools in the city so students have access to them. In an era when we're talking a lot about school consolidation and closure, I find it distressing that we're not also talking about how to increase quality school options in the city. Uh, we cannot close our way to quality. We've got to think about having better schools in the city, and charters are an important part of that. The second thing that charters are designed to do, and this is not as, as widely recognized, I think, outside those of us who work in charters, is they're designed to put pressure on districts to adapt and be more responsive. Um, we have tens of thousands, in fact, 18,000 students on waiting lists today trying to get into charter schools, and parents increasingly demand them in their neighborhoods. Um, we've got no problem filling up the seats that have opened over the past five years. Instead, we've got many more parents and students than we can serve, and so that, I think, is creating pressure on the district to adapt and be more responsive. I think that's good for the system. I think it winds up improving it long term. I'm going to go to Jackson. Leave Charles to the okay. be number three. Jackson? Sure. How's everyone doing tonight? <laughs> good. Thank you for having me. So I think it's important to get out of the current present conditions of schools and think about longer term trends. When we look at what was the period in American history where we saw the greatest reduction of the achievement gap between African American students, Latino students, and white students, it was in the 1960s and 70s during the Great Society programs. When the discourse was one about egalitarianism, teaching critical thinking in our schools, and humanism. And we've now entered this charter, charter era of so-called choice where many of the buzzwords are performance, competition, and some of the concerns that we have in the Chicago Teachers Union and many of our parent and community allies is that this is going to really narrow the curriculum, distort what's cur currently happening in our schools. If you look at Diane Ravitch, she talks about how um, you know, recently NAEP scores have, have gone up to historically high levels. They're not going up tremendously, but schools are not failing, and graduation rates are going up. And they may be incrementally happening, but if you destroy schools and close them and privatize them and disrupt them, um, you're not really getting a clear sense of the, that incremental change. Not that everything's perfect. There's problems. We need to deal with those things. But you don't do it by divesting. So, you know, you look at a Noble Street Charter School. What do they do? They do a lot of test prep. They kick out kids who don't do very well academically. They push out kids who have discipline problems. So that idea that every child deserves an education is no longer the case in this new paradigm. And the ACT, we know, is going up not because human IQs are going up. It's going up because people are getting better at taking tests. So what does that say about what are the real things happening in terms of instruction in our classrooms that are benefiting children and their families? Are they becoming more critical thinkers? Are they being able to engage civically in the society? Are they just becoming test prep factories in the schools? We don't know how they're doing in college. That data hasn't been released as far as I know by INCS. Um, there's a lot of information we need to look at to clarify what are the real consequences of this movement to privatize our schools. Um, I would just like to say that you know, this idea of going from implementation to idea to implementation in a short period of time 
It runs roughshod over people's rights. In schools that have been closed and destabilized where the parents have had no say, yeah, so Mr. Broy and you know, the, the people in uh, offices downtown can make these decisions on the backs of the people who have to live with them, and that's unacceptable. Um, in addition, I would say in, in terms of meeting the needs of parents, students, and teachers, uh, they destroy LSCs, which is the formal voice that Illinois provides to parents to make decisions about their schools. There's no legal requirement for charters to have them. They destroy the, the unionization of schools. So, you know, the vast majority of charters don't have formal uh, rights by teachers to bargain over their conditions. I'd like to see if Mr. Broy would agree to have a neutrality clause to allow that to happen if the staff at charters would like to do it. Um, in addition, they, um, we see that, you know, they claim these 18,000 people on waiting lists. But Mr. Broy was very prominent in the media over the strike saying we have 3,000 openings. Come enroll your kids in right now. So which is it? Do you have openings or don't you? And then this idea of transparency and democracy is even more critical. Taxpayers are paying a lot of money. Uh, $500 million in the school budget goes to charters. And yet the Civic Federation and the Consortium for Chicago School Research say they'd love to examine charters in greater detail, but they can't because they don't have access to the budgets and they don't have access to the performance data to allow them to do so. So there's a lot of questions and problems with this whole process and how it's unfolding. We've got a lot of work to do before we allow these charters to expand because we don't really know what they're doing. At Andrea, I'll give, you, I'll give you a chance to respond, uh, but Charles, why don't we hear from you now? Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> the man in the middle. We put him there for a reason. Oh, boy, yeah. I'm, I think my job is probably to disagree with everybody, and I'm, I'm pretty good at that. So, uh, I need to start out by making a distinction between the charter school and the charter school movement. I have very different feelings about those, th those two. For the most part, I am convinced that there are some, a distinct minority of charter schools that do a very good job with a certain stratum of students, right? I think a better job than those students, they get a better education than they would in the schools to which they would otherwise have access to, right? I believe that, right? I also think that's a fairly small number of schools locally and nationally. Nationally, so far as I can see, the Stanford study which says about a fifth of the charters, something under a fifth of the charters are strong. That still seems to me to be the most convincing body of, of, of data that I've seen. Of the data that Lorraine showed, the important one, right? The figure that counts is that exceeds figure. That's, that's the best easy approximation. It's only an approximation of how many of our kids are ready to move on to the next step. 15 for one group, 16 to the other. The other has selection advantages. They are not, it's not a random sample. That is at best a wash, right? Uh, on one of the most important metrics. I give them credit for what they're doing uh, with high schools, but the small schools movement in this city, which was to some degree, my sense is destroyed by the charter school movement, was also producing better numbers in, in, in terms of graduation, right? And they tended to be more community-based institutions than most charters are, are, are right now. Nevertheless, I want to say some charters are doing a good job, I think the charter school movement is probably doing a better job of training principals than our schools of education, and that is to set a very low bar. Um, I think, and I, I expect to get, get pounded for this, the charter school movement to a significant degree accounts for the recent liberalization of teachers unions. The fact that teachers unions are now showing more concern for the growth of students than they did 20 years ago is in fact due, is in part due to the boogeyman of the charter schools. I believe that, right? That means to me, and some charters have earned a place at the table, it's not at the head of the table. Going forward, I would like to see charters have the same data and reporting requirements as any other public school. We just can't find enough about what's going on there. Going forward, if you take a child in September, you need to have that child in June, right? Uh, neighborhoods, we should have stronger neighborhood preference. I actually believe we should just go to neighborhood boundaries, right? And neighborhoods should have a say in what kind of charters come in the neighborhoods and whether charters should. Funding for charters, as far as, and I don't, I'm not as conversant as I should be with the funding. It should be at least equal. And see, what I would do with charters, if I were in charge, I'd have them focus on hard to serve populations, in which case I would argue they should have extra funding, right? What I am emphatically against, 
given the data which are publicly available right now as anything that looks like rapid expansion of charters in the city, right? First of all, you don't need to, to expand an intervention. Intervention is the right, right term. It is not, in fact, a reform. You don't need to expand an intervention which you have not yet evaluated. And to my knowledge, to my knowledge, that has not happened, right? Second, if you're going to expand, it would be, make a great deal of a sense to me before you expand charters, improve the ones we already have, right? So that there is some capacity for, for developing schools before we go out on another limb and I think waste a great, great many resources. Before we expand, let us take a very close look at the cities in this country which have already committed themselves to rapid expansion of charters. I don't, again, I'm not claiming that I'm expert, but I will say the data that I know are not comforting, right? Let's go back to the NAEP. And we have NAEP data on 21 cities, right? Suppose you ask from the NAEP data in the early grades, how well in these 21 cities do poor children read, right? Because that's one of the tests for most of us, right? How well is a city serving young, low-income children? It's a heck of a range, really. At, the, at, 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 at one end, the superior end, cities like New York and uh, New York and Miami have about a quarter of their low-income fourth-grade students at or above proficiency. At the low end, cities like Detroit, Milwaukee, Cleveland, five to eight percent. So that's the range, right? If you ask then how the cities which are heavily charted look on this chart, and in this 21 cities, the heavily charted ones, more than 20% of their students in charters are DC, Philly, Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee, and Houston, every one of them is at the wrong end of the distribution, right? Chicago right now, with 14% of our fourth graders in poverty reading at proficiency, Chicago beats most of those cities right now. The only one that is above us is Houston. It's only two points above us, right? It's not clear. Again, this is not causal data. Let's be real clear about that, right? Uh, it is also not data that makes me say, we really need a whole lot more charters in this school right now, right? It, 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 it is not clear that the cities which have done that are profiting from that in ways which help the poorest children. And I know I only have a half a minute left, right? Yes. Uh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. The charter movement, I mean, I, I can say what I want to say about that pretty quickly. I think it's pernicious, right? In its current form, I would not have said this even five years ago, right? Um, and I understand, like, like any other movement, it has a wing that is altruistic and idealistic, and it has a wing that's opportunistic and self-serving. Um, part of what, what